right, we're going to call this uh, meeting to order the uh, work session on August 12th, 2019. Um, Dr. Barrow, is there any uh, changes to the agenda? No, sir. The uh, agenda is ready for you. I would recommend the board approve. Just need a motion and a second to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Yes. Four oh. Um, now let's start with the uh, presentations. Okay. Uh, first on the agenda is 3A. We uh, think everyone recognizes that we've uh, completed our first week of school last week. And um, uh, I know in my bulletin I shared with you over the weekend, I uh, certainly uh, appreciate all of the hard work uh, by our district office, by our building principals, their leadership teams, their staff, uh, all of our departments. It really was a, a great first week. I, I can I, I told our group this morning that I did not uh, remember a smoother opening, and that's credit to uh, all of our folks. So uh, we've got just a little bit of information we wanted to share. Ms. Heron and uh, uh, Ms. Presley King are going to come up and uh, just kind of give you some real highlights of our uh, pre-planning and uh, teacher induction, new teacher induction, and then, of course, our first week of school. So, ladies, if you will. Good afternoon. Um, board members, you should have a copy of our um, new teacher induction um, agenda. Sorry. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. But you should have a copy of the agenda and also um, for our new teacher induction program and uh, the survey results, which were very, very favorable. We had 111 respondents and we had nearly 150 participants in uh, new teacher induction. So as I talk, Kay's also going to be taking us through uh, some pictures that highlight new teacher induction and other pre-planning activities and actually the first couple days of school. That's okay. So as you can see, we started out with um, a greeting of all, everyone, all new teachers and administrators across the county were present. Dr. Barra did a welcome as did Mr. Hollowell, and we also have a picture of our Teacher of the Year providing some wonderful inspiration for the start of the school year. Um, here we had a highlight of some schools uh, in the photo booth. This one is particularly Spring Hill Elementary being highlighted. And then different uh, professional learning activities conducted by some of our content coaches. Digital learning was also um, presented that was a response by many participants from last year to increase our uh, training with digital learning platforms. So we responded to that. Not only did have a, a large group session, but some breakout sessions by choice. Um, here's um, the group in Mentors Cafeteria, and this was the last day of training. We did some large group work in there with PBI, by PBIS and um, just taking care of the social emotional needs of our students. Highlight is always the last day our um, breakfast is provided by the Retired Teachers Association and the Education Foundation gives everyone a $25 gift card. All the new teachers get that, so that's part of the breakfast there. And then we ended the day in Whitewater High School's auditorium and we had some keynote speakers there, just again, inspirational. Dr. Um, Marcus Broadhead spoke and he gave his story about his schooling and some gaps that existed and how he became very motivated to be, you know, uh, not just a, a great teacher, but a great leader for teachers and a supporter of teachers. And we had Carolyn Waters. We've had her for three years now, and she uh, focuses a lot on literacy and instructional frameworks and gets everybody up and going and inspires them too. So we ended it with the drum roll at Whitewater High School. But in between all that, we had lots of sessions, and you could see in the program some of those things. So it was an exciting um, three days there at Mentor and Whitewater High Complex. The next day, they ended up um, on Friday, spent time in their schools. 
um, with their leadership teams and mentors and also had darkness to light training if they needed that. Here's our group that's our planning group. Um, most of these folks are our admin interns from this past year and our department. Um, Ms. Ray Presley King and our respective secretaries and we brought back uh, Mr. Chris Key to help co-lead uh, the team and they did an awesome job, great leaders. This was some summer PL that happened. Uh, Ms. Audrey Tony helped coordinate some training for all of our assistant principals on 504 and other groups spoke, ECS. RTI, so that was a great day here, um, even before new teacher induction that occurred. And then this takes us to the convocation where Dr. Barrow greeted and met everyone and laid out his vision for the upcoming school year. And we had some wonderful training and inspiration by Dr. Laura Riffle on the 10 precepts of behavior and gave us some great strategies. She spoke to the elementary teachers in the morning and paraprofessionals and leaders. And in the afternoon, it was the secondary level that she spoke to. Very engaging speaker. And these are just some pictures, and you can scroll through these a little quicker, Kay, of the different PL opportunities that occur during pre-planning. And as you can see, they're just not all sit and get. They're active in motion. And um, this is CTE right there. And some more of our content specialists presenting. And I think the highlight for me of all of our summer activities was uh, the first day of school. Because in the end, we, um, we all, all of the um, district office personnel who were available um, came together to really prove that we are a PBIS district. And we went out and we greeted our students at the bus stop, or not at the bus stop actually, at the bus loop or in the car loop, and uh, just welcomed them to school. And I think that the results were amazing because um, I expected to go outside and hold up a sign and kids, it was first thing, first day, they were sleepy. No, they were actually quite awake and uh, their parents, I think their parents were real happy to see us and the bus drivers, as Kim mentioned, one of the bus drivers commented on how she needed that. Um, as much as the kids needed that. So um, kudos to Amy Henley for uh, coordinating that and making sure that we got, could all be out there to greet our students on the first day of school. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a terrific idea. So I'm glad it, it went fun. well. It was absolutely fun. Yeah. Any questions? Well, thank you ladies for your work. I know that, um, uh, and, and this is just a real high level view, but I, I certainly am uh, very proud of the, the staff that we have and the excellent teaching and learning that we have as adults, uh, certainly that's going to help us with our young people all throughout the school year. So thank you ladies for your effort. Um, would like to um, move on to item B if that's okay, Mr. Hollowell, I'm looking at um, our end of grade and end of course results. I know Mr. Brian Batera, our coordinator for uh, assessments here with us and Dr. Turner may jump in as well, but we wanted to share these results. We've had them for just a little bit. They've been embargoed, but now they're uh, open for uh, public review. So, Brian, if you will, please uh, walk us through those. All right. Good afternoon and greetings from the assessment department. Um, our milestone scores are in, and we're looking really good in some areas. We have a lot of strengths. Um, particularly in English this year across the board, three, um, three, third through eighth grade and then ninth grade looked really nice. Um, we had a dip in 11th grade EL or English language arts, but um, if you look at those ninth grade scores for those group of students, they're in line with that, with how those students did in the ninth grade. Um, particularly, we had a seven point increase in our third grade English language arts PL4 a nine point increase in fourth grade, um, a five point increase in fifth grade, eight point increase in sixth grade, a four point increase in seventh grade, and a three point increase in eighth grade. And then in high school, we had um, a 12% increase in ninth grade. Um, fifth grade math, elementary math, fifth grade science, and fifth grade social studies are holding steady from where um, we were last year. We did see some increases in um, 
sixth grade math, there was a four point increase um, and a four point decrease in our PL1 learners. So that was nice to see that not only are we increasing our PL4s, but we're also decreasing the um, beginning learners as well. And then seventh and eighth grade math is holding steady. Um, our eighth grade math and eighth grade science scores are holding steady, but if you'll remember our Algebra 1 and our physical science in eighth grade, that is continuing to increase. And so while we're seeing um, that we're holding steady in those two areas, we keep in mind that our top learners are taking the Algebra 1 and the physical science. Yes, sir. Brian, how many years in a row is that? I know since I've been on the board, it's been every year we've talked about physical science. And, and I, remember, I understand that right. a lot of the advanced kids are sure. really in this school. Right. So how long has it been? Um, in eighth grade physical science, we've offered that three years in a row. Um, for, you for that subject yeah, I don't think we've declined. Kay, will you pull up the um, eighth grade? There it is, eighth grade science. Um, you'll see the big drop was actually, Kay, will you pull up the graphs? That's where you'll see the four years, and that's where we can see. Yes, go to eighth grade for me. Eighth grade science. So that that twenty sixteen year is that where we were at twenty one percent and then we dropped to fourteen. That's when our top level students started the physical science. Um, now in algebra, that's been going on for five years. We've had that credit for five years. So um, when you look at the physical science for high school, you'll see the big jump from, I think it's 3%. Okay, can you go to physical science? Yeah, one of the things you see is high school, yeah. One of the things you see is that um, if you compare the high school physical science scores to the middle school physical science scores, it's on this sheet right here, that what you see is that um, Performance levels one and two at the high schools are higher, but when you look at our middle school students who are taking those for high school credit, your percentage of students scoring at PL one and two are very low. So now so it, fluctu it fluctuates level. some on levels three and, three and four, four, but I would say that's very contingent upon um, what group of eighth graders you have that year. You know, we know that every year one group of students in a particular grade level or class might be stronger than the previous uh, year. Is um, it possible, though, that we have a curriculum disconnect since the first, regardless of a slight, you know, drop or improvement, it's still a sizable, it's a real sizable number, right, a one, two, both in eighth and ninth grade. Is it, is, could it be the curriculum doesn't really map to the test and our kids are learning what they're learning and doing really well, but when they take the test, they're being tested on stuff they haven't. Well, the, the curriculum is, the test is mapped to the curriculum. Okay. So um, Georgia teachers are involved in that process, um, and that happens on a yearly basis. And so test questions wouldn't get through if they weren't aligned to the standards. So Brian, like on the 2019 you're showing, if I read that, the orange and the gray, and I add those together, is that 44, right? Like are you talking about eighth grade? The physical science. Yeah, it's ninth grade. It doesn't matter. Just this one on the screen, if you look at it, it says uh, for 19. 37 and 20. Is that or uh, 16, I, I 16 and 20. Oh, I'm sorry. Just for, for the one and two. For the one and twos, yes. So does that mean, I'm just making sure I understand it, 44% of the test takers in that group didn't quote unquote pass, if you will? That's, yes, that's Almost correct. Passed, for, that's across the all schools at that grade level. For physical science, yes. I just remember Barry and I talking about it last year, mm -hmm. and it just seems like I noticed a bunch of strengths, a bunch of improvements mm -hmm. all over the board, but this seems like that area in, in the math and the algebra. Right, the algebra. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't have the answer. It just seems like almost half the kids in the county not passing sure. the test. Yes. Um, Do the half the kids in the county make a C or lower than that? <coughs> Do we have people making A's and B's in that class? I can address the high school a little bit because in 16, when we first started the physical science, my scores were abominable at uh, Whitewater, and then the next year they went 35%, and then the next year it was only 19% at the PL1s. 
It's because the teachers weren't teaching the new curriculum. See, that's what I was asking. They were teaching yeah. the old curriculum, and when we got the scores back and I got them in and I said, okay, let's start teaching the standards, then all of a sudden it went all the way down to 19% as far as, and then I, uh, 17%, I believe. And then uh, Mr. Cole has continued that because there's still 19. It's, of course, you know, we, we want it to be better than that, but, you know, we used to teach physical science in high school, and the, phys the teachers who then picked it up when we brought it back were teaching the way they used to teach, and it didn't match up with the standards. Now, I can't address the middle school. I don't know what was happening in the middle school. And this school. is our second year under the new science standards. This 2019 was our second year under new science standards. Is that correct, Dr. Morgan? Okay. So if I look at last year, we had 40% that got a 102, and this year we kind of we had a 10% drop, right? We were 44. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know it's just one area. I'm just saying, you know, I'm always looking for, you know, things sure. to hone in on, try sure. to improve. There's so much good, and I don't want to distract right. you in any way. It just it jumps out of me because I remember that physical mm -hmm. science conversation last year, right. and I think the year before. Yeah. Dr. Morgan, you uh, want again, to part of that? the reason for the implementation of the physical science back at the middle school was to interject another uh, academic elective and, and working to try to bring additional rigor to that. So uh, I do think that, and, and I'll say this in just correlation uh, with the ELA improvements, uh, particularly in the elementary and, and middle school grades, um, this is, I guess, the second or maybe the third year that we've implemented our new ELA curriculum. And so we're beginning to see, I think, teachers becoming more comfortable in teaching the content, and the performance has uh, definitely shot up this year, according to the, at least according to this one metric. Um, the physical science is certainly something that uh, we want to continue to work on. Um, you know, maybe even looking, I know, I can remember the first year we did it, we had um, four of our high schools that didn't didn't fare real well, but one of our high schools, it was actually with Sandy Creek, but that teacher had taught physical science prior to, I think she may have even been new to the district, so everybody then said, okay, what are you doing um, in, in your physical science classes to yield that kind of result? So. Uh, we can l go back and look and see where we are with those physical science teachers and, and continue to check that. But um, just not making excuses, just well, talking about, uh, well, you know, well, performance. Say, Dr. Brown, like I talked to Dr. Turner about mm -hmm. math and grade performance, A, A and B honor roll. How many of the kids on A and B honor roll also are, are quote, unquote, getting a one or a two mm -hmm. or not passing the standard? And it was higher than I would have guessed. I mean, it was higher than I think any of us would have guessed. But when you look at this one, it just seems it just seems more pronounced. That's all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, there's something to it. It's worth looking at. Sure. Um, it's probably outside of what we can tell on this chart. But uh. yeah, I'll, I'll also mention that the high school. It used to be years ago that the lower level students took physical science because it was easier. And the new physical science is not, not easier, easier. It's not easier. but it's word true. spread among the kids, take that physical science because it's easier. So you have the lower level kids in there, which also does skew the grades a little bit. So just, just for my clarity, so in 2016 when we had 71% not, not passing, that was when we probably weren't teaching to the standards? I can only address my school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah okay. So it was the first year for those teachers. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Any any other questions any other or comments? The the one thing you know, and overall trends, and this is not incredibly scientific, I'll tell you, but just looking at the number of threes and fours, uh, we've seen some real strong growth there. We've seen a reduction uh, in the ones and twos, which is what you would want us to see, and um, those are. Trends that as teachers get in and get settled, they'll be looking at when they go through their school improvement plans and addressing a lot of those growth areas at that time. And just as a That's reminder, a level two is considered partially proficient. It's um, you know it's not that a, a level two is a failing score. Those students have gained some proficiency. They're just not at a level three yet. I just have one more, and, and again, you know, there's a lot of great stuff here, but the one that jumped out at me was the fifth grade math. 
um, in some schools, a high number of students scoring at level one. Uh, and what I did is I went back and looked at the students in fourth grade math, and then when they moved to fifth grade, how that compared. And it, a lot of cases, it was like 50% worse. The, you know, 50% of them got a two or a three in fourth grade, and when they hit fifth grade, bam, they're down to a level one. So that's the one that jumped out at me. Now, again, not having worked in elementary school, I don't know if fifth grade math is that much different. Is that what caused that? Mm -hmm. And well, it's only in some schools. It's not all the schools. Right. Well, at our curriculum meeting last week, every everybody in the department got a folder with all this data, and so their homework for the next meeting is to go through the data and look and see what trends we identify so we can begin to see, okay, where do we need to focus on? And so that we're monitoring that, looking at that as well. Okay. Can I ask one more? Sure. Um, again, prior to my coming on the board, I know the board hired seven or eight people or approved seven or eight people to be hired to work in the schools. Um, I don't know how those people are being utilized because I wasn't on the board then, but when I look at the scores, just I'm, I'm targeting elementary now, there's a couple elementary schools that look like they need a lot of help. Are all those eight people going to those schools or are they going to all the schools? The, it's seven instructional coaches seven, that were hired. Okay. And they're split between, they each serve two schools, so they're seven to over 14 schools. Um, a lot of their focus last year was more on English language arts as opposed okay. to the math because we were in our second year of implementation with the new reading curriculum. The first year was a pretty heavy lift, as, and to be honest with you, the second year was still kind of a heavy lift, but if you look at our ELO gains, right. yeah, I mean, it's I, been I, I pretty significant. That. And that, that's why I was asking, so, what did they So I think we've seen some real changes in practice with our elementary ELA curriculum. And so, you know, we are looking at the data. If we feel like we need to do a bit of a shift to focus more on math, we can do that. And that's part of the job of the instructional coaches is, you know, once we come together and we look at the data and we say, all right, this is where we need some bolstering in our program, then that's where they can put their focus. Yeah. We've had a Looking at the elementary schools and the fifth grade math, you know, like I see one school had 3% of the students scored at level one, and another school had 33% mm -hmm. scored at level one. So it seems like the 33% schools should have the instructional coach there like 100%, and the 2% or 3% school really doesn't need the instructional coach. Yeah. And I'm not telling you how to do your job, but, you know, that, that, that makes sense to me. Well, there is some flexibility, but it's not just the instructional coach. Then we also have Lisa Lindsay, who is our content area coach. She's our math IST. And it's actually probably Miss Lindsay who gets pulled more heavily into schools with more need than the instructional coaches because we're trying to balance out that coaching. Clearly something that we're going to continue to look mm -hmm. at. This is our first blush, and as Dr. Turner said, uh, the coordinators are digesting the information um, and when we come back and have presentations to the board uh, from our buildings um, our uh, our focus is going to be what we're on our growth areas or at least that's what we want to be able to focus on um, and we'll be able to share more details about the data at that point Mr. Abel yeah. and what we're going to be doing about it um, but um, you know, a lot of this information, like I said, has a, we haven't had it that long, and, and uh, but we it is public now, and I wanted to make sure the board knew that we were aware of what we had, and I wanted to share it with. And that you. that's what I kind of want to want to ask. Like, when when did we get the data? So the public release was two weeks ago, Melinda. Do you remember? Yes. About two weeks ago, yeah. and we see it about a week and a half or so before that. Yeah. So less than a month. And, and is it one of the one of the things that the new the pilot assessments that others are working on is to try and get that feedback loop a little quicker because it seems like we're getting the data really you know we're already in the school year and we're trying to okay now where do we need to get our resources so it seemed like man if we could get that data back Sooner. quicker mm -hmm. that would help and the DOE has heard I'll, that. I'll, I'll yeah. wait my magic they've, wand. Yeah. <laughs> they've heard that. They've heard it about CCRPI and they've heard it about test results. So, yeah, they they hear that message. So, at the follow up presentation, will we be able to get the analysis of the positive and the negative trends? That, that's 
those are the kinds of things that I hope I hope that we're able to share with you then. Yeah, because looking at the one school that had uh, 33 percent, what's interesting is those undergrades, their third and fourth grade maths weren't that bad at all. This is fifth grade, so mm -hmm. maybe there's something to it as you dive into those. It, it could be. Um, you know, at one school, I know the fifth grade teacher who was responsible for ELA and social studies was out for second semester. The, the long-term sub that they had in there was, uh, was a certified teacher, but she'd been out of the classroom for a little bit and was not as familiar with um, current standards. And so you see a dip with that particular school, but that's the story behind the data. It doesn't mean that folks weren't trying to do what was the right thing, but when you have, you know, your teacher who's out and someone trying to step in and fill that gap, um, you know, that's the result sometimes, unfortunately. So as much as we try to control and support that. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Patera, thank you. We'll continue to review yes, this data with our folks. Um, moving on down to uh, item 3C, <coughs> uh, I know we had a request to talk about our facility use policy, and Mr. Sanders is uh, here and is going to share with you exactly um, the board's policy, how we're implementing those kinds of things. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Barra. And I just I wanted to point out I do have uh, Ruth West and uh, Jody Koenig with us today. Uh, Ruth, as, uh, as you all know, is, is retiring at the end of August, and uh, she, she likes to sit in the background and not be recognized, <laughs> so I'm going to embarrass her right now and recognize her. Uh, Ruth is, uh, has just done a phenomenal job um, with the community school and has always been a great uh, great ambassador for our school system. So I just wanted to, to recognize her and I did have her here in case there were questions that I couldn't answer because she's, she's done it so much longer than I have. But she will be replaced by Jody uh, Koenig. Uh, Jody had been uh, in facility services uh, with Mr. Satterfield uh, at the front desk uh, for several years and, and has some school experience. So. I've been training, cross training with Joe, uh, with uh, Ruth some, so we're excited about having Jody come on board. So, uh, Ruth, thank you for all that you've done for us. We appreciate you. Uh, as far as the facilities use policy, uh, Kay, if you would, I uh, pull up the the policy itself first. I've, I've included three items in your packet: uh, a link to the the use of school facilities, which is policy KG, and uh, I'm certainly not going to read that to you. Uh, the one thing that we always keep in mind, and, and it's really, it's number one in, in that document right there, is that the that school-sponsored activities uh, have first priority uh, always. And then it goes into the second priority would be uh, booster clubs, uh, parent-teacher organizations, um, and such, that they would have use as well as uh, use without charge. And so that's, that's the first thing that we look at when uh, uh, when, when folks are, are asking to utilize our facilities. And, um, and then we go down through there and uh, look at all the, the other the items as well. And as you well know, we do have, uh, there's one part in there about um, intergovernmental agreements with, with county government. Uh, we do have an agreement with uh, the county rec department. It's been a longstanding agreement uh, where uh, they pay us X amount of dollars for use of the um, of gyms, and uh, we primarily are limited to, um, and that's during basketball season, uh, we are primarily limited to elementary gyms because during that time our high school and middle school gyms are being used until late in the night uh, for, for basketball practice and games. And, uh, you know, you look at, at our high schools and, uh, you know, with the number of teams they have, they have, most of them have two boys ninth grade, two boys JV and a boys varsity, and then double that with, uh, with the girls' uh, teams as well. So those are, um, those are used extensively. Okay, okay, if you would go back to the, uh, the other. Then I, I included, just for your, um, your information, the, uh, actually the rental agreement form. And the process, and you, you see there, one thing I want to point out, school activity slash booster club fundraiser. Uh, they check that. We do work closely with our schools when um, I'll just use uh, if a football during the summer, the football team may host a um, some type of seven on seven passing camp or some other camp, uh, then we'll work with them uh, when that is a, a true fundraiser um, and, uh, and they're not using the lights and the air and that kind of thing. But the first first uh, 
step in the process is get this completed and get it to the principal of that school and um, the principal is the is the first sign off and once they have signed off uh, they they get that to Ruth and then she begins that process um, and um, you know if, if for whatever reason the the principal deems it not available then uh, they work through Ruth and, and we work with uh, the person or the the company that uh, is requesting the rental and uh, and then go from there and, and if we can make other arrangements we'll certainly make other, other arrangements with them It goes into uh, the community uh, community school account. Tom, is that that's accurate? Yeah, this money is running the community schools uh, account fund, and then we at different times we've used that money for different things, but mainly to reimburse for the facilities charges. Um, for example, several years ago we used some of this money for um, the turf fields. And then we also uh, two summers ago we replaced middle school scoreboards in the gym uh, gyms with that money. Well. Somebody asked me if the individual school got the rental fee for that. No, sir. It, so it, just goes, it goes, goes into the system. Gotcha. Okay, okay, if you'll scroll down. And then uh, I included the, uh, the fee schedule. And as you'll see, there are two, two different rates. There, well, the hourly rate, and then there's the hourly, hourly rate for the nonprofit. Um, and then we break those down by, uh, by area. Uh, the auditorium is a pri is a fee. The cafeteria is a fee, and then I want to point out two. Okay, if you can just scroll down just a little bit more, two areas: uh, parking lot and extended building use. We just we have request quote in there, and that is primarily for the movie industry. Uh, we get a lot, and you'll see in in the final document that I have where I've broken out with what we've rented with the movie industry. We get a lot of uh, requests for for parking lots. And it's primarily when they're filming somewhere, uh, kind of in a remote location, and they don't have parking for all the extras and whatnot. Uh, we'll, they've used uh, Cleveland and Bennett's Mill a number of times. Uh, Sandy Creek, uh, due to its location, is another another area. And they'll park folks there and shuttle them back and forth. And so we just we work with with a group uh, to to come up with a, a fee that we feel is appropriate. Uh, we knock on wood we've not had a single issue with uh, with them leaving the parking lot unkept uh, after they've used it uh, when school comes back in on Monday I haven't had a, an issue and Ruth I don't I don't believe you have either and the same with uh, with extended building use and, and that that comes uh, like the uh, where we rented out uh, for a, uh, about a year and a half I guess it was the uh, old transportation facility uh, to uh, assemble productions was one. Uh, we've done the same with uh, the kitchen here at the LEC and the kitchen out at Tyrone. Uh, so those those we don't necessarily look at by the classroom, kind of look at the situation and, and come up and work with Dr. Barrow and Tom and uh, come, in to, come out to an agreement uh, that we think is fair for all. Okay, okay, if you, and then this one, I apologize, it's, it's sideways on us, but um, I, what we want to do here is, is especially since uh, the question was posed uh, uh, regarding the film industry, wanted to show what we have done over the past several years with the film industry. And you can see it started off a little slowly, uh, 14 and 15, we had one each year, 16 started picking up a little bit, 17, 18 had, a, had several, and then this in, uh, on into 18, 19 school year. And, um, I think at the at the end of the day, okay, if we can scroll all the way down, and now I want to no, before you do, I'm sorry, Kay, right there. Notice uh, Tony's uh, motion pictures with LEC Kitchen here. Uh, to this point, we've um, accumulated about $114,000 from them, and then the uh, symbol production in the time that they were down at the old transportation was about 150. So uh, about $260,000 were from those those two companies. And then uh, for a total of, okay, if we can scroll down, about three, $360,000 with the movie industry. Uh, the one request that we get uh, more than others is for Tyrone. And, uh, and a couple of things with Tyrone. One, the, the, front, the front area, the administrative area, and that wing is rented out to a dance studio. And uh, then the, the kitchen, is, as you've seen here, is also rented out, so that leaves that back hallway, which is stored full of, of a lot of furniture. And 
and up until uh, a few months ago, we had we had told everybody it was uh, it was not uh, we couldn't lease that area, and it's primarily because we didn't have we would have to move that furniture out of there. I didn't have the personnel to do that. Plus, I didn't I didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, but uh, when I did, I met with one group out, Mike and I did, and Ruth um, several months ago. And uh, the guy uh, who was out taking pictures, they they send, they send a guy out to take pictures. Then he goes back and he shows it to his people, and then they decide if it's if it's what they're looking for. And uh, and so uh, he came in, and I, I explained to him, look, I don't have the personnel to move this, and I don't have anywhere to put it. If I did have the personnel, he said, Mr. Sanders, this is what we're looking for all the time. We're looking for closed buildings, and we're used to it being used as a storage facility. And uh, so that's when he went through. If if we see that this is fits what we're looking for, we will pull it out. We will put it in pods, and then we'll put it back. That's a game changer at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So I said, I understand that. Great. So he took pictures and went through, and he said, uh, you know, you guys, you'll hear back from us if this is what we're looking for. And so he said, we're we're used to not being able to use uh, classrooms that are in buildings that are occupied because school's going on. And so. Um, so with that, with that knowledge, we'll certainly, um, I don't mind showing the facility at Tyrone. Uh, we're just, we, we don't need to look at long-term rental, but these short-term two, three days, I think are perfect for them. So um, we'll, uh, Ruth and I have talked about that going forward to make sure that, that we'll look at that. And we've, we've showed the uh, D building uh, in LEC several times. Uh, because there's some classrooms down there that they can use. So we're working with the groups as they come through. Um, it's, uh, you know, we are somewhat limited in, in what we can rent them because the school's being used. But uh, as you can see, we've, we've had a number of, uh, of uh, the movie industry work with us, and we found them to be very, very good uh, tenants, so to speak, very good partners. Uh, the Symbol Productions, uh, when, even though they were renting from us, he told me, if you ever need anything, let me know. Cleveland Elementary and the Media Center, they wanted to do some things and change up. And so I got James to go out with me and uh, wound up he, in between shoots. He took his, his crew, uh, his set production crew, out there and uh, tore down uh, a house that they had built in the, uh, in the swamp. Uh, of, of the uh, school in the media center and rebuilt it for them about half the size and didn't charge them a thing yeah. and uh, and that was his way of giving back to the community and uh, so uh, so that's kind of the process Ruth did I miss anything major and, uh, hey Mike I have a couple questions uh, one sure. is um, and this is just I'm passing on questions I've got sure um, is Fayette Middle um, does it have a wing that is separate from uh, the programs we have there that can be rented out? There is. Um, AV Pride uses that right. uh, for their after school program, so they they are in there. Uh, but that is one that that we could show them a couple of rooms. Uh, again, as far as a long term, okay. it wouldn't be good long term. But uh, some of these short terms, like we we have, right, but not for uh, a, a school year, or not for right, a, right. right. Uh, what about uh, the Tyrone gym? I get so it's, in Tyrone, I guess it's the same. Know. They would have, as long as they're willing to so it's full of stuff. clean it out okay. and and put it back. They they could have it, and uh, and that's that's what is is that case is that way with the the whole backside of the Tyrone school. Yeah. The only part of it that's really that we couldn't even lease out for a day is the, where the dance studio is. Right. And uh, I even talked to our attorney about that because we have it in there. They can't sublease it. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mike, if they can't sublease it, you can't sublease it either. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Moving on to um, a millage rate presentation and discussion. Mr. Gray is going to come down and, and share with you um, uh, what we've had an opportunity to start the advertisement process as uh, required by, I guess, the Department of Revenue. So, Mr. Gray, if you will. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barrow. The first document you see is uh, the timeline. Um, you can see that we've already begun advertising last week, having a work session today. Uh, we'll advertise again on Wednesday for the third meeting, and it's kind of funny you have to advertise for all the meetings before you start them. Um, then we'll have the first and second public hearing next Wednesday, 
and then uh, the 14th, and then on the 21st, um, we will have um, the third public hearing and the millage rate adoption, and then we'll send it over to the Board of Commissioners, and they are scheduled to have um, the final approval uh, for their millage, which includes ours um, in the uh, process on the Thursday, the 22nd. Okay, and then if you go to the five-year history, you see this five-year history. This was posted in the newspaper last week. It gives the information um, on the, the digest. Just a couple of things to point out on the digest. Um, the top line, real and personal property, that went up about 7.9% um, this year. The gross digest went up 7.5%, but the um, exemptions went up 10.2%, which is right below it, so that gave a net digest increase of 6.9%. And then just the other thing to point out on the exemptions at uh, 1.2 billion, um, that is about 18.7% uh, of, of the gross digest. If you go back to 2014, it was about 16%, so it is quite a bit more um, it, exemptions compared to the gross digest. And even went back and looked at 2009, and up until that point, it ran about 11%. So we've kind of seen that increase uh, trend continue that we talked about before. Um, below the digest information on there, you have the M&O millage information and the taxes levied. So the uh, percentage of tax increase based on the levy at uh, the recommended millage rate of 9.25 is um, would be 104.4 uh, million total taxes levied. And so that's about 5.59% uh, more than the previous year. Below that, you have the bond information, and we are recommending the millage there to go to 1.271 mills, and that would give us enough to maintain the debt service uh, going forward. Okay. All right, then the next two sheets. Tom, oh, before, yeah, go ahead. Before you leave that, yeah. and um, I, uh, clearly we want to be very transparent as we have conversations about the digest, but. Uh, Tom touched on the issue of the exemptions and, and boiling that down into layman's terms. Uh, basically, that's one out of every five taxpayer in our community uh, that is getting a, a, a fairly substantial exemption f across the board. And we don't begrudge that, but as that number continues to grow, that continues to uh, have a pretty substantial impact on our overall digest. I, I think that's something that we have to be able to uh, communicate well and understand um, why we can't drop the millage more than we already have. The other thing I'd, I'd like to point out, the district had been at 20 mills for a number of years. Uh, coming out of the, the severe uh, uh, economic times that we had, um, once we begin to uh, stand a, a little stronger w with regard to our collections, um, I, I think I have to give credit to our board because we actually have dropped a quarter of a mil um, uh, several times, and um, I feel good about that from 20 to 19.75 to 19 and a half. We stayed there two years. We're dropping it or recommending dropping it again at 19 and a quarter. Um, if uh, the economy stays strong and uh, we don't have the increases in TRS and other health care issues, uh, it's possible that we may be able to do that again next year. I know we're, we'd love to be able to do that if we could. Um, but um, I do think if you look at uh, trends over time, I think we've been very, very conservative. Uh, number one, we have to be able to provide the resources that are teachers and our children need, uh, but we also want to be sensitive to our taxpayer. And I think over time we've been able to do that um, in a strong suit. So um, I, I think it's important to look at where we were in 2014 and where we are today. Tom? Okay, thank you, Dr. Barra. And I apologize for rolling through that so fast. Uh, if there's any questions on the five-year history, uh, any of the information that we need to, to drill down on. And that's, did you mention the, the bond? Right? Uh, yes, the yeah. bond okay. millage. Just wanted to make sure we yeah. are doing right. a yeah. full right. rollback yeah. on the bond. Right. Um, and that's not as significant. It's not as sexy, if you will, mm -hmm. but that is a full rollback. So yeah. I feel good about that. Yeah. 
So speaking of rollback, the next two uh, worksheets show how we calculate the rollback. Um, so the first one is on the regular M and O, and you can see now there's a lot of uh, numbers going across here, but basically what this sheet does is it um, looks at what last year's digest was compared to this year's and what is the increase that is just from reassessment and essentially what is the millage compared to that. So, Kay, if you'll scroll down just a little bit, um, you'll see that there the rollback millage rate on the right-hand side about halfway down. It's very tiny, but um, it's 18.35, and our recommended millage is 19.25. So we would have to lower it another 0.9, uh, almost a full mill, uh, to be at the rollback rate. Um, but that and shows a full you mill is be between five and six million dollars. Yes, sir. There's a similar sheet that's right after this that's for the bond. Uh, we don't need to really go through the details of it, but we are recommending what the rollback calculation is, which is 1.271 mills. So we feel like we're pretty steady at where we're at on our debt service. Okay. Um, the next document shows um, our, our calculation compared to budget. Um, and we actually did, the gross digest was actually a little bit less than what we had anticipated from early information from the, um, from the tax assessor's office, but there's a lot of different reasons for that. But um, we, we, this millage rate will come in a little bit under our budgeted revenue, about a million dollars, but we feel with the um, operating reserve we have and also our budgetary controls that we will be able to operate next year without any problems. Uh, based on that, so we're still recommending the 19.25 uh, millage, uh, which is a quarter mil reduction. And you can see on the right-hand side, um, at the rollback rate, um, we'll be a little bit over budget on for debt service. And of course, that would roll into uh, the next year for the following next year debt service. So at the bottom, you see there we have what the calculation is for one mil of taxes and a quarter mil of taxes. 5.4 million for one mil and a quarter, 1.3 million for a quarter of a mil. Okay. Any comments or questions there? Yeah, Tom, I'd like yeah. to talk to you offline sometimes just about uh, sustainability. You know, as a local government, we mm -hmm. have two knobs. We can say your property's worth more <laughs> or we can uh, adjust the millage rate. And so we have two dials we can turn. And so we've cranked up the house value dial and we haven't cranked down the millage dial much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just worried about as we keep both dials high and we keep hiring more and more people and spending more money, what happens? You know, we live in the world of business cycles. Yes. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. what happens with the next, bi next business cycle? I'm just, I'm, so that's what I'd like to talk to you about offline. Right. You know, how yeah. sustainable, where, where are we in sustainability world? Right. And, and, uh, and, I think and, what, and what happens next recession? Do we lay off another 500 people, 300 people? Mm -hmm. um, because I, I just would like to run our business in a way that we, um, um, can keep the people we have <laughs> yes and uh, and try to have a sustainable business model and so I don't want to get way in too deep into that right now but I would like to yeah you know, talk to you about that absolutely so, yeah I agree well, yeah, yeah and I think that's one of the reasons why we the board is keeping a healthy reserve so we do hit some yeah. bumps in the road we yeah. certainly part of it yeah cushion it so, so <coughs> yeah yeah and you have a little bit of help with the reserve obviously and then also uh, starting to bring the millage down. Uh, a little bit, although probably not as much as we'd like to, but it is um, at a you know a trend of it moving down. So, but we do have to be careful about. Essentially, those uh, jumps in value are not going to keep up, um, and could have you know a leveling out or even a downturn. Okay. Um, then the next sheet um, shows you this is part of the calculation of what we put in the ad for the newspaper to tell the homeowners and the property owners what their tax increase is essentially based on uh, the rollback rate. And so the average home with a fair market value um, of around $300,000, which is on average from the previous year's digest, um, was $300,000. And so on that type of home, it would be about $106 of a tax increase um, compared to the millage. And then below that is a, a average non-homestead property. The average value on that is 275000 so that's about a $99 um, increase compared to the rollback rate. Okay. 
And those uh, calculations are based on state guidelines, how we come up with that to present the ad. Then the last, work, last sheet you'll see is just our press release, and I think you'll notice that all the governmental entities use pretty much the same wording that comes from directly from the state to explain um, why it is considered a tax increase even though the millage rate is going down um, compared to the pre previous year. But we did include some things in there of uh, what is affecting this year's budget for 2020, the additional classroom teachers, additional staff support, uh, years of service credit increases, the $3,000 raise for classroom teachers and other certified staff, and the 2% cost of living increase. So um, that was uh, some of the increases in the budget. And um, so that um, has all the information of when the hearings are for the millage and the adoption as well. So we will. the next step will be to have our millage rate hearings on Wednesday and then the following week uh, to adopt the millage rate. Any questions, comments, concerns? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Sorry. Appreciate thank it very much. Um, last under presentations, we have item E, which uh, addresses our health and physical education adoption process. I know Dr. Morgan and Ms. Bonner are here. They're going to come and uh, share with you. This is um, uh, something that we do. Uh, pretty much on an annual basis, we'll look at, and I think the board re remembers last year we did our math adoption, and, and this year uh, is time for the uh, health and physical education adoption. Uh, so we uh, want to give uh, the board information about that and exactly what's going to transpire um, over this coming year. So, Dr. Morgan. Good afternoon, board members. We're um, going to just have a conversation about our curriculum um, adoption, our proposed adoption, and some things that are coming up from the state. So provided um, in your blue folder, we've provided a couple of information about our current proposed timeline, which we, are, we want to hear your ideas about the timeline, as well as some state rules that kind of govern um, the adoption cycle for health and physical education. Um, so the first thing that you see is the proposed timeline. There are a couple of things that we do want to note about the proposed timeline. Um, for one, we just adopted our PE standards last year. That's the full year um, of familiarization and orientation. And this year is the year that they have to implement the PE standard. Um, next, right now, we are currently under revision for the health standards. And if they're proposed and approved this year to the state board, they'll go into familiarization and orientation during the um, 2021 school year. Um, so we wanted to keep, let you keep that in mind as we um, think about adoption for health and PE. So during a normal textbook adoption, um, we normally convene um, a team together to solicit vendor feedback. So we propose a survey, basically um, having the vendors complete. What does your curriculum include? Um, is there a digital component to your curriculum? Does it include some of the things that the state board says that we need to include? And if you look on um, the second slide, Thank you, Kay. You'll see um, some of the items that we must talk about in a comprehensive health and PE program, and they include alcohol and drug prevention, drug use, disease prevention, environmental health, nutrition, personal health, sex education and AIDS education, safety, mental health, growth and development, consumer health, community health, health careers, family living, motor skills, physical fitness, lifetime sport outside education and fitness assessment. In addition to this, um, we also have to talk about um, Aaron's Law, Senate Bill 401, which is sexual abuse and prevention in grades K through nine, correct? And that went into effect last school year, um, and it happened 
at the beginning of the school year and they um, the state board said that it was uh, mandatory so we've added a couple of things to our curriculum and made a couple of updates to the current curriculum that we adopted to make sure that we're in compliance with that so basically we send out a survey the vendors tell us what their program includes um, and then we bring a committee together the committee will review the um, vendors feedback um, without the vendors being present so that we kind of have like an unbiased look at some of the um, curriculum and what are the things that they're offering um, after that they usually bring the list down to about five vendors to make it manageable and then we have the teachers test out the curriculum in their classroom and bring the feedback back to the larger um, committee. Um, after the committee hears the feedback then they say hey we want to out of the five vendors we want to bring in two um, for vendor presentation so we can really deep di do a deep dive into what this curriculum include the vendors will come in do a presentation we like to limit it to about 30 minutes no more than 30 minutes including questions and answers um, and then the committee usually votes on the curriculum and we bring the proposed vote to the board um, so that you all can see the vote you know the numbers and we bring you the charts and after that um, it sits public for for 30 days and after the general public gets to make comments about it we usually do like a Google form so that you can see all the feedback that the public has about the um, different curriculum um, and then we bring that feedback back to the board and the board gets to say yes we want to approve this curriculum or no we want to not approve it and make these uh, modifications so that's kind of like a standard outline of how um, a textbook adoption rule usually goes this is a little bit different because it includes a lot of sensitive topics to our community so we do want to be extremely transparent and um, in addition to it being an extremely sensitive topic um, the state kind of governs who um, should be on the committee with m the majority of the committee members being parents of non-teaching parents and family members Thanks, so, can I ask you a question yes to help me um, sometimes when coordinators come and speak to us, they make a clear distinction between the textbook and the curriculum. Are you using those interchangeably? Do we have a curriculum and we're getting a new textbook? Well, we have the curriculum or yes, changing okay. the curriculum? Or? No. Okay. So we are changing the standards that we use. Okay. So when I say curriculum, it includes um, the standards, the teaching practices and such. So usually when we adopt new curriculum, we adopt new teaching practices. That's why we have the conversation about the physical so science. So we're not just adopting a textbook. We're changing our standards and curriculum. Yes. Yes. So we're not. The textbook is just a support. The, it's a part of the overall curriculum. Okay. And the standards are actually proposed? By the state, yes. So the standards are the state guidelines. They're the minimum of what we should cover within it. So our curriculum includes the standards, the curriculum, um, different ancillary materials that we choose, different textbooks that we choose to adopt as well. Okay. All right. And so um, we wanted to just highlight some of the programs that we use right now. Um, Kay, can you go? That's the state rule which I've highlighted all the things that it says that we have to talk about these are the updates for Senate bill this is the language that says that we have to talk about um, sexual abuse and assault awareness and prevention um, and this is our current curriculum now we've been um, both Lakisha and I've been trying to find the date of the last textbook adoption for health and PE they were both um, adopted before our tenure um, and we think it was 2000 between 2002 and 2006 was the last time that we've had um, any type of textbook adoption for health and PE um, what we did what we've done recently is we've updated the modules for um, choosing the best which is the high school and middle school um, textbook and they just went through an update um, about the new materials basically they have new online access codes and such but we haven't changed any of the curriculum that we've been using since about 2002 to 2006 um, and as you can imagine there's a lot of new um, things on the market for students in terms of like drug prevention that's one of the things that we have to talk about and and there's things like vaping that goes on right now with our students, and that's not included in some of our curriculum. So, some videos from elementary hadn't been updated since then. Yes. And so you have a list of some of the videos um, in the parent letter, which is the last sheet in your folders. We basically, this is our parent um, permission slip. Um, so, to give. Um, parents and families permission for the students to participate in the program it basically outlines the curriculum that we use and it tells them um, the website where they can go and look at um, the material to preview it um, and give their student permission I'm, I'm just kind of curious how, about what percentage of parents usually opt out um, we don't have the exact number because that goes back to the school but I, from what I'm told it's extremely small very very small but we can Especially 
And the law that oftentimes is attached to it. Yes. But those provisions will continue to be a part of the new yes, adoption. Yes, they're, mm -hmm, they're mandatory. And uh, mm -hmm. also one of the things, and I would want to say this to the board, I, just in my initial conversations with Dr. Turner and uh, these ladies is that, um, you know, I, in order for us to be able to try to get good representation on the committee, um, I'd want the board members to be thinking about some people that you have in your district that you'd like to recommend and uh, give us a couple of names and we'll see uh, if their schedules will allow them to participate, those kinds of things there. But that's, that's down the road just a little bit. We've got a lot of work to do with the uh, pre preliminary pieces of getting the vendors together and, mm -hmm. and seeing exactly what's on the market. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Mr. Hollowell, if it's okay, we'll jump on down to the superintendent's report. And um, I know Dr. Turner uh, has been uh, working us pretty hard on finishing up the last tweaks to the system or district strategic improvement plan and uh, in fact we actually had a little bit of follow-up conversation this morning uh, but I think we're uh, really in pretty good shape I know one of the things that we wanted to tighten down just a little bit more was dealing with some of our performance measures I feel like we're in, in uh, much better shape there but I'll let Dr. Turner share with you well we shared this with you all a little while ago um, and one of the major revisions is we used to have as a goal to digital um, integration in, and instruction and infrastructure. And as we were grappling with writing performance measures, Mr. Farmer and I took a hard look at it and we made a decision to go back to a discussion that was made earlier where we would embed digital learning and the digital infrastructure piece into goal one, the digital learning piece goes into goal one with the Future Ready Schools Initiative. And then the other on the network infrastructure goes into operational effectiveness. So now we'll have four goals instead of five um, because we've embedded the digital piece where it was actually more appropriate to do so. And Mr. Rabel, I responded to your questions that you gave me and we did discuss your points in executive cabinet. We went and tweaked a little bit on the um, stakeholder engagement with live streaming as an initiative that we added that as an initiative and then you asked about certified staff and I responded classified. I'm sorry classified staff and I responded to that as well um, some of our classified staff are very transitory or transient in that um, they might be part-time or at will or they're hired just for that year under title one so while Miss Roberson tracks that the decision was made by that group who worked on that goal not to include that in there. And just as a reminder, our paraprofessionals are considered certified staff, so they fit under that umbrella of um, developing, retaining, hiring certified staff. And so. For the benefit of the other board members, my question was, we have goals in there for certified people, and we have goals in there for bus drivers, but we have anything for classified people. And that was my question, why wasn't mm -hmm. there anything there for classified? question on, on internal and external communication, there was nothing there on external communication concerning the board, like the podcast, our monthly meetings, et cetera, and streaming. So those were my questions mm -hmm. to Dr. Turner. So, so we're not going to do anything with classified? No, it's not, it's not part of the strategic plan, but we do train classified personnel. We do try to hire and keep highly qualified classified personnel is well, just I not do all that, but if we're gonna put bus drivers in there, not the meeting bus drivers, mm -hmm. so what's wrong with classified like kind of following in there too? Well, I think the I mean the bus drivers have been in, been in there because um, the bus drivers have been in there because we've just had a hard time recruiting them. Okay. So I think it's I think it's a, a, a just been a goal of you know, to have enough bus drivers to operate. Okay, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I understand yeah. that, but try to hire a custodian at nighttime at a high school too. Yeah. Same thing, and they're a classified person. Mm -hmm. I, I, just my opinion. That's all. Well, 
Dr. Barrett, I defer to you. We can take it back to Executive Cabinet. And well, we, I mean, we'd have to pull together the group that worked on that particular goal. I, um, I don't think the strategic improvement plan is intended to cover every single issue that we try to address. Um, I know that what this does is it helps us to focus on those key areas and when we're talking about uh, all of our employees are valuable to us. It takes everybody working together to, uh, to be able to run the district. Uh, but the focus is on um, our certified employees, not the at-will employees. I, I think there are a couple of other things um, that make bus drivers unique, uh, both in state law and in practice. Uh, but Miss um, uh, uh, Robertson, I see you raise your hand. I know you're dying to tell me something. <laughs> May I just make one clarifying comment? Sure. Questions about the plan itself. If not, um, I, while Dr. Turner's here, I do want to. Our model of achievement accountability certainly lines up with the improvement plan. They they can't be separated. Uh, we've made some modifications in the in the model with regard to um, the um, accountability piece as far as presentations at work sessions. Um, uh, as far as some of the uh, professional reading that we're doing with our administrative staff. So that's been updated as well. Uh, so those two items are together. Uh, Dr. Turner, I don't know if you want to mention anything else about the model of achievement and accountability. Well, you'll see under the monitoring piece, it gives you um, an outline of the different presentations you'll have over the course of a year where we'll be reporting out on different aspects of the strategic plan. And that, that's meant to give us some guidelines. I mean, if there's something that comes up or uh, these aren't written in stone, but we pretty well um, uh, have an outline of what we'll be looking at during the course of the year, at least from our uh, accountability pieces on the strategic improvement plan. Any other so questions? Did you add live streaming to the strategic plan? That we did under, I believe it's under 3.1. Three, I think. It's under stakeholder engagement. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, it's Scroll under goal down, two. Okay. And it's under parent, it's 2.2.5, parent and stakeholder engagement. So our first initiative, initiative A in that section is implement live stream technology for board meetings. So over the course of you know, not immediately, but over time, we'll be able to implement that technology. 2.25A. 2.2.5.A. Yeah, I don't think it made it. Well. You know, yeah. this is I the tweak. This is the tweak we made today. Got this it. was a tweak that we made today. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. This our our living, breathing document was alive <laughs> and breathing today. So as we worked on we it, we breathed some life into it this yes. morning, right? <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Uh, if the board is comfortable, we'd like to be able to bring both those items uh, to the agenda for your official approval at the uh, August 26th meeting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
facility update, of course, that's one of the um, big things that we've been working on. Mr. Satterfield, Mr. Sanders are here. They're going to give you a real quick uh, update on uh, all of the work that took place over the summer. I, um, uh, there were a few things that we were a little bit concerned about, but um, uh, Mr. Satterfield, Mr. Sanders, they waved their magic wands and, and got it done. So. Yeah. Mike, if you will, share just a little bit about the update. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'll quickly go over. Uh, we did have a, a busy summer, had a lot of projects. Um, uh, we finished, uh, as you well know, we took uh, two summers to renovate Fayette High. That was a, about a $19 million project, and we it spanned over t two, two summers. Uh, we did about $8 million worth of work this summer renovating the bottom floors where all the CTAE labs were and the science labs were. And uh, by the skin of our teeth, we got us a CEO at late in, right at the end of July, first week of August, and uh, got everybody moved in, and now it's uh, time to just finish up the punch list. Uh, McIntosh, the uh, contractor there, uh, actually got his CEO uh, early June. Uh, he's still got a few punch list items he's working on, but he's whittled it down a good bit. Got a little bit left to do, um, as well as here at the Lafayette Educational Center. We still have a few uh, punch list items working on. Uh, Oak Grove Elementary uh, was an amazing project that we worked on this summer. We did the phase one site work. And we, we did uh, about $2 million worth of work in six weeks. Uh, moved about 100,000 cubic yards of dirt and lowered the whole parking lot and rebuilt it. And it was, uh, I believe if it had rained one day, somewhere in there we wouldn't have made it. <laughs> but the, the good Lord uh, blessed us, and, and we had some good weather and, and were able to, to get the, uh, the site work, that phase one, part uh, completed. Um, uh, Booth Middle School, the, the replacement school, uh, the architect has completed the contract documents, uh, specifications and drawings, and has turned that over to Mija for them to put it out to bid to get uh, to come up with a GMP. We expect we'll have that probably by the, the workshop in uh, September. Um, Safety and security upgrades. Uh, we've gotten all the, the security vestibules in place. Uh, I'm doing just a few little punch lists here or there. Uh, but those turned out to be pretty nice, and the schools are slowly getting acclimated to those and figuring out how to use them. And uh, um, I think uh, it, it, it's going to provide a, a sense of security for the school and, and the parents there. Mike, if, if I can say one thing about that, just um, in, in talking with especially the uh, secondary folks, they have, uh, um, I think they've received a number of compliments from parents and, and students as well, uh, just with a, a more secure uh, feeling. And um, actually out at Sandy Creek, Richard Smith told me that they feel like it's actually um, improving their uh, tardy rate to class uh, because of, of them changing their traffic patterns. So, uh, so far the, the feedback we've gotten has been very, very positive. Yeah. Um, we uh, finished up right at the end of July the uh, film lab modifications at Sandy Creek. Uh, contractors got just a couple little punch list items there to work on. Um, North Fayette, uh, we finished up. I actually thought this was going to run significantly past the start of school, but uh, a contractor worked hard and uh, was able to get a CO uh, the, la the first week there in August. So we had a CO and was able to use the uh, connector on the first day of school. Uh, still have a few odds and ends punch lists there. Uh, high school track upgrades, we started last week at Whitewater High School and demoed the existing track there, and they started demoing McIntosh today. 
Uh, now that will take, uh, the, of course, the, the install crew is finishing up at another school system. I believe it was Metter, Georgia. They're finishing up uh, down at the high school there, and then they'll be coming up here uh, once they complete that. Um, so um, that seems to be moving along fine. Um, Nor North Fayette, um, we, uh, have, we've been working in conjunction with the Fayette County Public Works, and they've come in and done a sizable amount of road improvements there on Kenwood, added a center turn lane and a desail lane and repaved that area and restriped it. Um, they completed um, the part out on, on the uh, Kenwood Road about two weeks ago. They got that paved and striped and ready to go prior to start of school. They're also helping us to expand, extend the length of the queue line, and um, they're working on that. I was up there early this morning. It looks like uh, either today or tomorrow they'll start uh, pouring the curb and gutter and then follow behind that. They've already got all their rock base down, but they'll follow behind that uh, with the paving. I, I'm guessing if, if the weather stays about like what we have uh, this week, they'll probably within about two weeks, three at the most, probably wind that up. And that'll be nice. That'll probably double the length of the queue line, and that'll help get that traffic off Kenwood Road. And um, that's about it. We had lots of other small, many, many small projects this summer uh, that we did, but that was it for the, the major projects. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Satterfield? Um, right, good thank work. You, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, move on down to uh, um, a safety request. I know Dr. Lombard and Mr. Sanders, they've been working uh, with our uh, schools and uh, our other facilities, and we've got some uh, equipment that um, they've uh, put into the list, and we're going to let them share that information with you for your consideration, certainly ask any questions. Good afternoon. The uh, list you have uh, there is based on uh, the needs we determine uh, uh, from the GEMA site surveys we conducted all of our schools uh, and reviewed all of them. Is it me? Or is it? Okay. Um, we also, I'm first going to go off each one of the schools, uh, and we walked through the principal, assistant principals, determined the needs they had, and those are some of those based on emergency drills, other things. So it came up with a comprehensive list, and it's been uh, a little while since we asked for these things. So what you see on there are, uh, of course, cameras and uh, access control. We also uh, include some of our administrative buildings, uh, goes a road, those areas. Um, we are expanding the lockdown button, so we have one in each one of our ASP offices, and in several other locations. Um, and uh, based on uh, a lot of our exercises, the schools wanted to have additional two-way radios. Uh, they were limited and they needed to replace a bunch of them because they were very old. And they had purchased those themselves for the most part, so uh, we were going through that. Uh, there's some other security items, and some of those include uh, like classroom window blinds uh, for part of the lockdown drills, um, some emergency uh, cart uh, items such as bullhorns, um, some classroom emergency bags, traffic control devices, uh, things like that, metal detectors or handheld metal detectors, some items like that that sort of accumulate into that uh, other items. And one, one thing I'd like to point out on cameras, uh, not, uh, certainly not all of these, but a lot of those, we are trying to increase the number of cameras in our elementary schools. Uh, when they initially did the install several years ago, each school got six. six six cameras or so and of course they don't need as many as, as the, the upper schools but but we uh, we have found some areas of lacking and that we need to increase uh, within our elementary schools as well so that that's a, a piece of that uh, security camera piece. None of the elementary schools had any or very few of them had outdoor cameras or putting them so it's uh, at their entrances uh, which is going to help them see things uh, as you're probably aware, the uh, entry control, they have little cameras they can see, but it's not a very good picture. We're trying to put cameras there at the entries so they can see that better. Uh, and some of the blind spots, uh, they've moved some trailers around, those sort of things, so we're trying to get some better outdoor uh, surveillance of uh, parking lots and playgrounds as well. And, and a lot of them didn't have cameras in the gyms or the cafeterias or their uh, other uh, 
utility areas, and they really wanted that so they could get a better picture of what's going on. Okay. Questions, board? Just one. Uh, is this amount here in addition? This money we were supposed to get to, didn't we get money from the state for safety? We are. We have we have one more project that we're working on that that we hope to utilize that money for that okay. is forthcoming. This is this will come out of East Plus Two that uh, where we have designated money for safety and security. We do have a plan for that other. It is really it was going to be six one half dozen the other, and this we would like to move on quicker, more quickly than than what we. Um, the, the other project we have going on that we'll we'll bring to you when we have a little bit more information, a little bit okay. more prepared. Questions? Thank you. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks, guys. We uh, certainly hope to be able to bring that to the board uh, again at the August meeting for your uh, uh, official approval. Um, next is uh, a project that we've been working on for quite some time that uh, deals with our guaranteed maximum price for the uh, Oak Grove Elementary. And Mike, and Mike, if you want to come back up and, and our, uh, see our friend from Meiji back there, good to see you. And uh, certainly we have uh, questions that we want to be able to answer. I know Mike mentioned to you that uh, we've completed the phase one piece of that project. and. Not only was that the actual construction and, and of the parking lot itself, but it also in, uh, in, uh, included uh, architectural and mechanical and engineering fees. Uh, we had to have all that done in order to be able to plan so that we could see where we were going uh, with the, um, the additional work in phase two. Uh, one thing I know that uh, Mike will talk about is some of the new pieces of construction. Uh, but I also want uh, the board to understand that this is a part of our overall total renovation of the school or update of the school with the HVAC roof, uh, tile, painting, uh, the things that we've been doing for our other schools over the last six years. So, Mike, if you will, go ahead and walk us through uh, phase two. All right, I will. Thank you, sir. I, I would like to introduce I have Jason Rogers with Major Constructions. Here, in case uh, you have some questions that I can't answer, I would love for you to give them to him. <laughs> um, I do want to give you a, a little background information on, on the project and address some of the issues that Dr. Barrett was talking about. Uh, first of all, uh, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the layout of the actual Oak Grove Elementary School, but the front of the school uh, actually is, was accessed by uh, Crosstown Road. Um, and the front of the school actually had just a little bitty parking lot, probably didn't hold 15 cars, had four doors there, and if it wasn't for a little bitty canopy, you wouldn't even know where the front door was. Um, <clears throat> the back of the school which is where the vast majority of parking was, which is unusual. We don't, usually don't have that set up. At elementary school, most of the time, the vast majority of the parking is in the front. But the biggest parking lot was in the back, and that's also where the bus loop was. Well, at Oak Grove, we only have four buses. So we had this huge drive in the back for a bus loop and only had four buses. Well, several years ago, uh, Peachtree City came to us with a problem. Our, our queue line on the front of the building where the parents were dropping the students off was so long it was extending out on the Crosstown Road and, and blocking the traffic and creating a lot of problems for Peachtree City and the police department. So they asked us to consider at that time flipping and, and bringing the bus loop to the front where, they, where we just have four buses and you try to put all that traffic in the back where we had a, a lot longer queue line available. And that way, if there was any backup of traffic, it would be on Log House Road, which is a, a not quite as traveled road as Crosstown. So we did that, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago. And it, it, it's worked out pretty good. Um, Peachtree City has also indicated to us that down the road the possibility that Crosstown could become like a four-lane road. 
and they they made the comments you might want to consider making the front of the school on log house rather than on crosstown and and really since most of the parking was on the back side of the school that that seemed to make sense so as we were uh, designing this project the work on this project we took that into into account um, and we've basically in this first phase uh, we've taken those 15 parking spots out of what was the front of the school so now we have a true bus loop where the only buses would, would be there and then we've expanded the back parking lot uh, we, we've also lowered the grade down uh, so that uh, the two proposed additions would be on ground level on the same grade level as the building uh, prior to that if you'll recall the, the back of the school sloped toward the building uh, and so we've dropped that down so that both the uh, admin addition and the gym addition would, would be level and would be easy to build. Um, the gym that, that we've proposed um, is the same size as the gym that we built at North Fayette and the one at Peachtree City. It's comparable to all our prototype PE facilities. The existing PE facility that they have is probably less than half the size of our prototypes. It's very small and butted up against the uh, cafeteria. Uh, so with this proposal was to convert the old smaller gym into a stage that would open up into the cafeteria and then there would be a music room behind that stage. This would be identical to what we have at our prototype elementary schools. Um, and Oak Grove is the only elementary school we have that does not have a stage. And they have been asking for a stage for as long as I've been around. It's, it's been, that's a long time, long too. Time. Yeah. <laughs> so we incorporated that in, into the plan. Um, the existing music room, which is just across the hall from the old gym, we would convert that into a workroom and to two gang bathrooms. Uh, that's on the lower commons area, and the lower commons only had restrooms in the classrooms. There was no restrooms out in the hallway. That's where kindergarten first grade was. Uh, when we ran the numbers on it, we were actually short some fixtures and needed additional restrooms to meet state standards. And that seemed to be a good location to add that. Um, we proposed a new administrative wing that would be uh, on what we would be calling the new front of the building. Uh, and from a, uh, Kate, if you could, could you find that for me? Uh, from an architectural standpoint, it would uh, it would be uh, to the left there, the the yellow area to the left, to the right is the gym. Right, that's right where the area is. There's also an uh, an elevation of that that area, uh, but it it definitely gives some definition to it where you know where the front door of the building would be. It, it, it will stand out. It would also have a security vestibule and tie into right where the existing office is. It just will be on the front side of the building where the existing office, which is an undersized office, will now be on the back side of the building. That existing office will, will be converted to a counselor area with a conference room and a testing area, and there also will be a studio that they, uh, that will tie into the media center to be utilized for morning announcements and for various productions. And that, that kind of gives you an overview of, of where the building was and what, how far we've come to this point. Um, and, and where we would like to go, uh, you know, at this point, 
you know, we're proposing to put the administrative wing on, which was not in the original plan. That was something that going through the design we came up with and realized there was a need for that. Uh, the gym has been in the planning stage for you know, probably three years uh, that we had the gym planned. Um, as Mike, it turned point, Mike, you may want to point out, you know, that's the that would be the admin wing there. That's we, right. Would, would have built in the security features that we yeah. would design. What you're, you're looking at now, that would be uh, right behind the tree is the admin wing uh, where you would have the students would be dropped off. And you can see from an elevation standpoint, it's raised up with some columns and it, it's uh, a good bit taller than the rest of the building, so it, it, it will stick out as being the entrance to the school. And then right behind the uh, the flag, that structure, that's the new gym that would be uh, on the southwest corner of the existing building. Um, you know, previously we came to the board uh, with the phase one site work and uh, presented a, uh, a GMP, well, the GMP was for like 2.2, but we added the architectural fees, the engineering fees for the entire project to it, and the board approved three million for phase one, but that did cover the cost of all architectural engineering fees for the entire project, both uh, phase one and phase two, and we've come back. Now Major has presented us with a GMP of uh, just under a 11 million uh, for the two additions and the total renovation of the interior of the building, new roof, HVAC, uh, painting, floor covering, lights, uh, replacing the ceiling, uh, all the tight work that we generally do. Um, and so uh, all total we would like to request uh, a a GMP or, or a budget for the second phase of 11 million. Uh, so that would be 11 million for the second phase and the 3 million that the board has already uh, approved. So the total project cost would be at 14 million. And Mike, we do have, we'll receive state funding of about 1.6 million or just under 1.7 million that's in there. Those would well. be reimbursable yeah. funds. Once we complete the project, we can apply to the state for the capital outlay money, and they would reimburse us about 1.6 million. So basically, what we're looking at, board, is is about 12 million 300 thousand ballpark uh, with our East Blast funds um, after everything is said and done. Yeah. Um, but um, wanted you to see this. We got this information, I guess it was last Thursday. And so we worked real hard to, to get it into presentation uh, form so that you could see. Uh, I know you haven't had a lot of time to look at this just yet, but we wanted to go ahead and put it on the table so you could review. Um, we know that uh, we have two pretty significant projects that we've been talking about for the last several months. Uh, the Oak Grove project, which we now have some um, hard numbers to look at, and then the replacement school uh, as well. So we hope to have that in September and um, at the work session, uh, preferably. And um, I know that um, uh, Jason and the crew there, they're already working on that. So they've got the information. They've just got to get the bids back in, and they'll be able to put that package together for us then. Mike, can I ask a question? So, so an administrative wing, what does that mean? Is that like a principal's office that's already there, kind of redone and spruced yeah, it, up? It's, it's and very kind of similar if you went to Kedron or Spring Hill, any okay. of our prototype elementary schools, it's very similar to the office space that's okay. there uh, with Assistant a security vestibule conference room. incorporated okay. into it. Um, Oak Grove probably has the smallest office in the, in the school, so it's a very small office area. Um, the existing the existing principal's office area 
front office would be reconfigured into uh, for the counselor. And but so for the 14 or the 12 and change million, none of that is classroom space at all other than, well, I believe there was a music classroom, wasn't there? There was a music or an art classroom? Well, yeah, you, you, you consider the gym is classroom space. Oh, uh, no, I mean, yeah. we're going to have a it, gym name. Yeah. I'm talking about like what you did at Peachtree City stuck out of my mind. You yeah. created a couple of different yeah. classrooms that allow. We did. You're right. We picked up four, four kindergarten four. classrooms uh, where the uh, older media center was. We were able to pick up four there. Uh, in this space, we really aren't picking up any additional instructional units because we're having to, to use what was the old music room where, where we initially thought we might pick up a classroom there um, when it came out that we were actually below state standards that the guidelines on the, on the restroom facilities, we had to put some additional uh, bathroom areas in that. Anytime you add an addition onto a school and you send the plans up to the state, they look over the entire plans, uh, both the new addition you're putting on and the existing building. And if they find out in the infrastructure, like in restrooms or cafeteria, media spaces, hallways, any of those areas, if you're deficient, if they're not big enough, they'll put that in as a requirement that you've got to upgrade that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one area that we were low in was uh, in terms of the number of fixtures in, in the school. So I, I just know as we're talking about the, the, the new boots, if you will, and possible growth over a, you know extended period of time, it just seems odd that we would do such a massive project without giving ourselves any uh, leeway. I, what's our capacity? Are we at capacity there right now? Yeah, good one. Are we at capacity, students? I, I um, we no, we could put there. we could put a few more students in there. Um, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but there is some. Some classroom space there. Their their uh, numbers could could come up some. Um, we at one time we had a large amount of portable classrooms there, uh, but we no longer have any any portable classrooms there. And we have seen uh, just for the board's information. Over the past two years, we've seen about a 25 yeah. to 30 percent increase in construction costs. Um, three years ago, you could uh, build a new school for oh, 180, 190 a square foot. Now, now we're hearing numbers in the 225 to 240. Uh, depending on the architect and how complex the design is and the finishing. In fact, Jason, you Peter. might want to speak to that. What kind of numbers have, have y'all been seeing lately? Well, I, I, had, I had a couple of questions, but Barry, did you have anything? Yeah, um, you, you're kind of talking around what I was going to ask, and I, I, had, I was just wondering what this project was per square foot. I mean, what are we spending per square foot to add, you know, a gym and a cafeteria? Because that's a big open space. It seems like it wouldn't be as much as a um, building a school. But you're looking at 14 million for yeah. Um, and, and we've got an overall price that includes all the roofing and all, so it'd be kind of hard mm -hmm. without going back and dissecting yeah. the, that actual and portion out to, to come up with a square foot yeah. number. And that's I, I do know you're, you're absolutely correct that big open spaces, for instance, a, uh, a, a PE be. facility or a media center are less expensive to build that square footage area because it's such a big wide open space. Right. Whereas bathrooms cost you a, a lot of money to build in or a kitchen mm -hmm. is out of sight. The square foot cost for just that that type of space. Well, and we do the, have some and, and renovations that's, that's to part the kitchen of, the, of this. Yeah, part that, of the reason why we started out with the conversation is 
it's not just the new construction that's expensive. Right. It's the, we're, we're talking about the renovation of the entire school, and that's right. really where the bulk of the the cost is coming from. My, you know, uh, you can go through Which and talk see. about all the schools that we've renovated, and it's pretty well in those ballparks. I, yeah. I, I had a question. I, I very no, I got a couple more questions. Um, okay. I understand that um, we have a middle school that could be had for about twelve million dollars. The whole entire middle school. And um, you want to see 14 million for just renovation versus we can buy a whole school for 12 million. Help me reconcile that a little bit. So, so, so we, we got our, our entire middle school appraised for about 12 million dollars. And why is it so much more expensive to build new than it is to buy an already built building, I guess? Well, of course, and the market drives everything. Right, right. And um, right now, steel's up, concrete's up, aluminum's up. Labor has gone up significantly. Um, um, just the, the labor to push a broom around and keep keep a project clean. Used to, you could get people for ten dollars an hour all day long to do that. Mm -hmm. Now it's fifteen or more for for that same type stuff. Well, and you're talking about a forty-year-old building. Right, right, versus a brand right. new, it's kind of like buying a house. You know, buying a brand, new, building a brand new house is going to be significantly more than buying a forty-year-old house. Yeah. And I guess my last question: Do we get multiple bids on this? Is yeah. it, or is this just? They, uh, but I've, if I had to, to to look at and try to kind of break down what it's costing for the different components that we have here, I, I would say we're we're, we're, we're in the seven and a half to. To eight million for the general renovation of, of the building. The roof on this building is 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 cut up a lot. It, it's going to be a little bit more expensive than, than typical. But you, you've got probably about eight million for all the renovation work inside and, and outside. Probably looking at about two and a half million on the gym that's going in. Uh, about a half million on the interior renovations of the old gym. Um, and creating a new stage there and a new music room. Um, you know, we, we, we think the overall cost of the administration is probably about one and a half million to put that administration wing in with all the canopies and, and the walkways and the security vestibule and, uh, and the site work, the upgrades, uh, redoing all the parking lots uh, probably cost us about a million and a half for just the parking lots. Now that overall cost was more than that because we were doing some grading work for the admin and for the gym while we were doing the parking lots. We also relocated storm lines, gas lines, the electricity relocated gas lines. We did a a lot of things in phase one that were really associated with either the administrative wing or the new gym. Right. And but, Mike, I want to make sure we answer Dr. Marshman's last question as far as the bids. And Jason, you can speak to this. Um, each each bid category, we looked, we did look at that last week when well, when we went over and met with them to get the, uh, the GMP. And Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we got at least two bids on everything up to four bids on, on each category. So there were multiple bids in, in each each category. One thing that I'm pleased with, and I will say this to the board, and, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but in our debrief, you told me about 50% of all the contractors that had bid were local. So one of the things that I always look at is trying to involve as many of our local contractors as possible because that can then generate additional monies in our community, and that's a good thing for us. It's It can be an economic engine for us. but. Um, you know, if if we were having everybody come from outside to do the work, I wouldn't be as happy. But this is this is a pretty good okay. project for us. The, and and I, I pretty much. I, I had a, I had a, I had a okay. question. If I could. If I could. Right. The um, you know, we know that the uh, you know steel tariffs have gone up. Whatever. If the tariffs were able to go away, and like say steel price were to go down, would we be able to realize those savings in the GMP? Well, the. The area uh, that we could realize some savings in would be uh, on our contingency fund. And we have almost a half million built in 
in contingencies. Um, but we, we don't get to go back and renegotiate the, the contract price because that's a guaranteed contract price that he's willing to do the project for. If steel goes down a little bit, he's not going to lower the price just as if it goes up a little bit, we're not going to pay more. Uh, the contingency fund is just there for unknowns that should come up. Uh, or if we decide we want something additional in the building, then we have that contingency fund. Now, at the end of the day, when the project is completed and we haven't tapped into that contingency fund, we do get that money back. Um, but it's not like a cost plus kind of situation where you know, if all of a sudden in next month that the bottom fell out of steel, I don't believe. Now, I'm, I don't want to speak for you, Jason. But. I think, you're, I think <laughs> your question is based off your, like the market situation and what, what we as a market can anticipate in the fluctuation of the steel tariff. It, it, it moves like a snail. So you'll be, you'll be finished with this project even if they change the tariff today or it went away and there was to be saved, saving to come, we won't realize it in our industry until years from now. So it'll be the next time you bid a project is where you you may see it if, if it goes away. Yeah, okay. it's just in the cost, and it's not just in steel; it's it's all the way across the board for materials. Yeah. yeah, and and they have to what to call buy out a project. So it, as yeah, soon no, as I the board, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. board, did you have any? Any other questions? If okay. there if there are questions, though, please let Mr. Satterfield, Mr. Sanders know me, uh, and we'll work to try to be able to uh, uh, get that information for the board. Uh, certainly, we want to uh, get some direction uh, whether or not to proceed or modify this project or uh, do the whole thing um, at our next board meeting. So, if we can uh, have that there. Mr. Sat uh, Satterfield, thank you for the presentation. Right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, looking at uh, the last item under our report is the attendance enrollment, and this is, uh, uh, I think, good news for us. Um, at the beginning of school, we look at two different things. We look at our um, infinite campus report based on enrollment, and we also look at what we call live body or uh, warm bodies in the seats. And um, typically those numbers are here, and then over time they come together and then they're, they're very, very accurate. Um, right now, um, our, um, our body count, or, or students in the desk, we're at 20,379, uh, which is up um, last year at the same time we were at 20,097. So we're up not quite 300 students, so we feel really good about that. Uh, if you look at the data that we've got for you, this is, this is um, uh, you can see the elementary and middle school numbers are where we had the increase, and the high school's down just a little bit, but that's a good sign. Uh, we've got new families moving in or new kids coming on board. Uh, typically, that means they're going to stay with us for a while, so I'm, I'm pleased with the uh, enrollment growth, and of course, that will uh, positively impact us uh, moving forward. So. Um, unless there are questions about the attendance or enrollment, we'll continue to watch this. We have, I can share with you, we've made a couple of moves uh, prior to the first week of school with staffing. Uh, we have a couple of our um, sites that have, uh, we're right at the bubble, and we're trying to make a decision on whether or not uh, we provide uh, a teaching slot or a pair pro support. Uh, transfer from one place to another, uh, another place, uh, from one school to another school. Uh, we're watching that very, very closely, very carefully, and uh, hopefully we'll have that settled within the next week. Um, but uh, if you have questions or concerns about the enrollment situation, please feel free to, uh, to give me a call or touch base with Erin. I know she's got those numbers real handy. Did I miss the attendance? Because you yes. gave us the enrollment, but what's the attendance? Uh, that's that's the kids who have shown up is 20,379. Oh, okay. That's, that's both. Yes, sir. Those are the ones that we know are here. Uh, 
some of our folks. Or some people uh, in the role will never show yeah, up. That, that's right. Uh, this some, is the people who've showed up. Yes, sir. So far, so good. Or people who we know that have uh, they've been on vacation or been out of town for whatever reason. They're just getting back in. Our uh, our principals were really good about having their teachers call parents just to see they didn't see you the first day of school. Are you coming? Are you not? And so we've really worked hard to try to verify these numbers uh, uh, with, with close accuracy. Uh, if there are no other questions uh, uh, with attendance, we'd like to move to item five and personnel. And um, we do have a number of positions uh, with resignations, reclassifications, elections, uh, separation, and we also have community coach positions. Uh, the board's had an opportunity to review those. Uh, I'd like to recommend that those positions be uh, approved. Okay. Need a motion to approve personnel? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Four of. Okay. Four of. Just a couple of things with information. We have a, a board policy. Uh, it's got just a little bit of an update. We've uh, you can see the update in red. Uh, we'll hopefully get that approved in the consent agenda next month or at the next meeting. Uh, one thing that I found uh, I'm, I'm excited about is that we've uh, been working with Georgia Tech and we have a great partnership that we've been uh, looking at in a number of different ways. But this most recent one is that the uh, uh, they're wanting to put a, basically a weather station. Uh, on the roof of North Fayette Elementary. Uh, this is uh, in order to uh, help the National Weather Service, and it's also a great opportunity for our students as they're discussing weather in their science courses uh, to be able to get data uh, from Georgia Tech. So I just want to make sure that we've gone through all of the checks and uh, insurance and uh, assurances from our risk management folks. We're in good shape. And uh, hopefully be, we'll be putting that up and our kids will have access to that data that the National Weather Service will be getting. Uh, last but not can, least. Can I mention one thing? Yes, sir, please. Mm -hmm. um, when I was principal at Sandy Creek, we had a complete weather station installed there. Yep. I don't know if anybody here knows it's there because it was such a long time ago. But uh, maintenance came out and drove holes through the wall and all, and they had cables run for computer hookups and the complete weather station and all. I'm not trying to say don't do this, but no. I'm saying there is one at Sandy Creek that everybody might have forgot about. Right. I, we'll we'll take a look at that, uh, Mr. Raybull. Thank you for sharing that with us. This is we're not spending any money here. This is Georgia yeah. Tech brand. And we didn't on that one either. I forget who it was came in and installed it, but I mean they ran wires inside for computer hookup and and everything. I mean it was complete setup. Good deal. Well, we'll we'll. Uh, uh, Dr. Morgan, that may be something that we want our science folks to take a look at. Um, last but certainly not least, we uh, and I, I don't know if you guys have been getting this information from the Georgia School Boards Association, but uh, they've uh, put into place a by board service. Basically, it's a cooperative uh, that they're uh, providing to all boards of education in the state. Um, this is just another vendor resource. Um, that uh, if we can get better prices for consumer goods, then uh, we'll take a peek at that, and that'll be done out of Mr. Gray's department over in purchasing, and uh, Mr. Roberts will be looking at that as he's comparing prices. Um, that completes all of our uh, regular agenda items. I do have uh, two items I need to discuss with the board in executive session dealing with property and a safety plan review item. Uh, we'd recommend the board go into executive session for those two items. Okay, need a motion to go into executive session to discuss uh, property and um, safety review plan, plan review? That's it. So moved. Second. All in favor? Four out. Need a motion to return from executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? 4-0. Dr. Barrow, any recommendations from executive session? No, sir, not at this point in time. Okay, without objection, we are adjourned. <laughs>